I was involved in a study as a resident uh, of veterinary public health and preventive medicine uh, at the University of Minnesota. After 19 years in practice in Western Canada, I decided to do a two-year residency. And this was one of the projects they put me on that lasted a couple of years. And actually, into my instructorship at the, at the U of M. So uh, Jeff Bender was, uh, was the lead epidemiologist on this uh, study, and I want to give him credit. Uh, so I'll just quickly go through uh, the study. I want to report uh, what we found at this point. Um, and just give you a little bit of a review about Clostridium difficile. I by no means am an expert on this, but uh, it is an anaerobic spore-forming bacillus. It's been identified as the causative agent of pseudomembranous colitis as uh, 30 years ago, over 30 years ago. Um, one of the main risk factors, well, we know it spreads uh, in, by fecal oral transmission, and we know that the environment in hospitals is one of the main causes, of, especially the hands of healthcare workers. Um, the major risk factor is a history of antimicrobial exposure, and um, typically uh, the two key uh, things that are needed to get uh, a hospital-based infection is the acquisition and growth of, of C. difficile, or the acquisition, I should say, and then it is thought that the exposure to the antimicrobials is what uh, allows the spores to, uh, to, uh, to grow, vegetative growth, and cause problems. There's um, also uh, a clear association with um, uh, strains that are, thought are, are antibiotic Resistance, especially the fluoroquinolones, and the mycins, penicillins, and cephalosporins. Um, just some terminology. The problem, the, the key problem, is uh, with C. difficile infections, which we'll, we'll refer to as CDIs, um, is that it's uh, one of the most common organisms causing healthcare-associated infections. And when those infections occur, they're they're uh, quite costly and have become more and more dramatic over the um, last decade. Um, as well, there's been an increase in uh, community-acquired or community-associated CDIs, and that's uh, the basis for this study. Um, we want to mention as well that there's uh, an especially uh, aggressive virulent strain, often referred to in the literature as the epidemic strain, it's a NAP1, it's a ribotype uh, 027. And this strain uh, produces uh, uh, two large endotoxins, toxins A and B, uh, and much more than other strains of cluster in seal. And it also produces a third toxin referred to as the binary toxin. So once again, a reminder on the risk factors. Um, the elderly are more susceptible. Uh, long hospital stays are important. Anything that is typically immunosuppressive uh, or is suppressive to the acid content in the stomach uh, seems to be associated with, with the issue. Over the past decade, as I mentioned, the, there's been a, a somewhat of an increase in community-associated CDIs, and um, they're thought to be missing some of the normal risk of factors uh, occurring in atypical groups. So the hypothesis for this study was that perhaps animal contact and the consumption of food derived from food animals could be uh, a potential for CD exposure. And the question is, could animals or food sources play a role in the increase in community-associated or community-acquired CDIs? So the objectives of the study, the objectives of the study, the wording actually said to, to assess, uh, when I looked over the grant, to determine the prevalence of CDI in a convenient sample, but uh, Jeff and I decided to, to, to change the wording slightly, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, we were to look at animals with and without diarrhea, and we were to focus on central Minnesota. Uh, we were going to also, uh, did I mention, yes, as well, not only were diarrhea samples, not that animal samples, both diarrhea and non-diarrhea could be collected, but also retail meats, and uh, the food part shouldn't be there, just retail meats are the food that was looked at. And uh, yeah, that covers that. For the humans, uh, we're going to be comparing um, isolates from a human study, an ongoing prevalence study in Minnesota, with these isolates. And uh, once they were uh, 
genetically characterized, do a comparison. So this is the these are the this is the breakdown of the samples over the two-year period, two-year plus period. I collected over 600 fecal samples from animals. Um, they originated from BDL uh, cases, BMC teaching hospital cases, so that's the veterinary medical uh, center teaching hospital, as well as farm samples and uh, pigs that had been sourced for research trials at the university. So anyway, I could I tried to collect samples. Sure. A little bit higher. Usually not a problem. Hearing me is usually not an issue. How's that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the meat samples uh, were to be collected from locally grown, organic, certified, or antibiotic free. That's how it was described in the grant proposal. I guess the thinking here was that um, there would be uh, a greater likelihood of finding uh, or being able to grow Clostridium difficile from these types of samples. They included raw samples of various uh, species, as well as uh, ready, ready to eat. Uh, um, Curie samples of different types of meats. Uh, and they were collected from butcher shops and local sources in central Minnesota. I think there were four or five counties that they were collected from. Um, and then the over the, although about 170 samples per year were expected during this time, the, the human samples uh, only amounted to 104 fecal samples as part of this uh, surveillance project. And it was specifically on community, community associated CDIs. So these are the characterization methods that were used uh, on every isolate, and this is how they were compared. So I learned a lot on this on this uh, topic. Uh, I didn't know a lot about some of these some of these uh, characterization approaches. Um, and as Jeff pointed out, I think you know in the swine uh, veterinary diagnostic world, we don't we don't do this very often. So this was a great opportunity from that standpoint to. Uh, to get some characterization done on swine isolates uh, from the porcine perspective. And, um, and I found as a swine practitioner, I had some trepidation about this project. Um, but in overall, uh, it was very valuable, I think, for, for me to be on the team as a resident with a swine veterinary background. Because um, the leaders of the project, uh, I think, had specific um, goals in mind. Uh, they didn't have the connection uh, as closely with agriculture. And so it, it was, uh, I think, a really good opportunity for us to work in a, in a, on a One Health project um, and influence, help each other understand each other's perspective. And overall, I think it, it, uh, it had a good uh, impact. It was a great experience that way. Um, when we, I think I got a little off track there, but. Uh, what I want to talk a little bit about each of these. Um, specifically, I want to point out that um, uh, you know the, cent the center two uh, typing approaches are, are PCR, and uh, I think uh, PFGE everybody is uh, acquainted with, but the nomenclature I think is important. I want to point out uh, that the NAP nomenclature is very common uh, when it comes to um, CD infections. And the uh, gene sequencing, uh, the deletion, uh, certain deletions are associated with increased virulence. So that's why we're looking at, at that. So just uh, so you can get an idea of the breakdown, these are all the samples. I think there were 561 in total. Um, and just a little bit of a, a breakdown on uh, which ones were positive. Um, the key thing I want to point out here, you can see that we uh, I, we, uh, we were targeting food animals primarily, but also wanted to look at companion animals. Um, and this is one of the places where a swine practitioner had an impact, I think, and that was when it came to um, taking samples from individual farms. There was no way that we were going to be able to get 200 uh, porcine individual farm samples. Just logistically, it would have been impossible uh, or very difficult. Uh, considering all the other things that a resident has to do. Um, and uh, so we ended up taking multiple sources from individual farms. And, and so you can see, I, I wanted to include the number of sources on the study, and, and we did that, uh, assuming that sources would be, you know, we have similar findings from similar sources, and we should think of them as an individual. So that's, 
when we talk about prevalence, um, I think that's an important uh, thing to highlight. Uh, you really need to take a look at how the samples are taken. And remember, these are convenience samples. These are these were not random samples uh, throughout the industry. Um, as well, what else do we want to point out here? Uh, just the percentage. You can see the percentage positive. Um, it ranged a little bit from species to species, and there was some variation. I guess when it came to the feline and canine sampling, uh, in some cases, animals were selected from the same um, shelter. So they were sourced to the DMC and uh, from a similar shelter. So although they likely came from different areas originally, I considered them to be the same source because they had spent some time in the same shelter. So we looked at that. Um, Jeff pointed out that uh, major samples uh, from, uh, he looked into this a little closer than I did, and uh, pointed out that cattle and swine were primarily from young animals, whereas the companion animals were typically more mature. And uh, the Clostridium, uh, we wanted to point out as well that I had to cut back on the total number of samples somewhat because we were, we were directed to collect only from Minnesota, and uh, there were some samples of, let's see, about 13 that came from out of state just because some directions got mixed up and so on when samples were collected. We still, still thought we'd, we'd uh, we do them all, but for the analysis, we come back to the Minnesota only. Um, as well, um, there were 65 animals that were had diarrhea. That's 12 percent of the total, um, and the range by species varied as far as uh, the percent of diarrhea amongst the species. And the CD rate, uh, in the CDI rate, I should, should say, was uh, higher among animals with diarrhea than animals that were healthy. That was statistically significant. So when we start doing the breakdown, looking at whether or not they're toxigenic or not, we're looking at the 41 out of the 547 that were popped, where we isolated clustered in difficile from the Minnesota samples only. And out of those, 71% were toxigenic. That is, they uh, were identified as producing a toxin of one sort or another. When we look at it by species, once again, we're looking at those 41 uh, clostridium difficile isolates. Um, we're looking at sources in this case, and uh, the number positive by, uh, we're using sources only, not individuals, and the percent CDI positive by source. All right, so, I'm sorry, out of the CDI positives, 17 out of 56, that's 30% of the pig samples were CDI positive. Of those 17, 14 were toxigenic. So you can see that for every species, uh, that's the breakdown. Um, bovine and porcine, a high, high percent, and equine, I guess, high percent were toxigenic. Lower in cats, 50 50, and the four that were positive from Kena. So this morning I added a couple slides, and I wanted to bring it a little closer for the, the pig group, um, just an understanding. I'm sorry about the, the levels of the cells. But um, just comparing, instead of, uh, it was pretty tough to figure out how to compare all the species with the human isolates, so I thought what I'd do is just compare the porcine isolates with the human isolates. So out of the 104 um, samples, that uh, human samples, there were seven that were toxigenic, so 7% were toxigenic. When, it, when we look at the porcine, um, 14 of the 17 were toxigenic. When we look at the NAP breakdown, these were the NAP types that were collected from the 41 animal samples. So NAP7, NAP4, NAP11, NAP6, and there were 11 on me. This is the breakdown uh, from in a pie chart format. And then this is the breakdown from the human standpoint. You can see there are a lot of more NAP types amongst the human population. Uh, but I want to point out the, the first, starting with NAP7, Right here, NAP7 is the blue, so that's NAP7, that's unnamed, that's NAP4, NAP11, and NAP6. Those are the first ones that look exactly the same here. So it starts up here, that's NAP7, the unnamed, NAP4, NAP11, and NAP6. When we look at, when we're comparing porcine and human NAPs that are shared, NAP types that are shared, these were the only two. So really it was only NAP7 that we could verify 
uh, being shared between humans and porcines in this sample. The unnamed, obviously, are unnamed and they could be very different from each other, um, so difficult to compare. These are the other uh, NAP types that were isolated from humans only. All right, so many. And then quickly, when we look at the other types of uh, typing, we have binary toxin positives amongst the 29 uh, toxigenic CDIs. So those are the 41 that were isolated, 29 were toxigenic. And then we did that breakdown to see what types of uh, what uh, toxinotyping was done. And some were, were, were positive for different, different typing. Right? Um, so binary toxin is here. 18 of the 29 were positive for the binary toxin of all the animals. And then toxinotype B, toxinotype is looking at the virulence uh, allele, uh, toxinotype 5, 76%. Toxinotype 0, 24%. And then the deletion, there was 14 or 48%. When we look at from the human side um, and the binary toxin, you can see that 23% of the human samples had the binary toxin and 59% uh, of the porcine samples. These are the, uh, you can see that here, the only one shared of the toxinotype 0 was the toxinotype 0 typing. And you can see that the humans had a much higher percentage, and it was not shared. The toxinotype five was not shared at all. And this is the deletion. I just wanted to point out that um, it was only the zero base pair deletion that was similar between the two, uh, but there was only one on the porcine side. All right, so. I want to point out this is this has been a unique collaborative approach, very positive, I think, from both sides. It's the first effort within Minnesota to look at all uh, to look at this connection, and it's very important to point out that there was no C, uh, no clustered into the seal detected in the food samples. I didn't show you a graphic of that, but basically there would have been a big fat zero for all 350 food samples. All right. Um, cluster in uh, cluster into the seal was identified in animals. But there was no highly pathogenic that epidemic strain I described in any of the isolates. There was certainly a wide variety of toxicity, toxinotypes and pulse, pulse, pulse types identified. Um, we want to point out from the porcine perspective that there's a high percentage of uh, toxigenic isolates. Um, there was only one NAP type that was similar with humans. The binary toxin is certainly present. And uh, toxinotype 5, uh, which was 76 percent of porcine isolates, was not present in the human samples in Minnesota. And uh, also, there was not much similarity shared on the base pair deletion side. I've talked a little bit about the cautions regarding uh, looking for prevalence of CD. Uh, we really ended up. This was a convenience sample, and we ended up. Uh, Looking, basically looking for the bug, looking for the bug and seeing if we could find it. Um, and we we focused on, uh, in some, in many cases, we were we were looking at young animals. We were collecting from young animals because that's what we had available to us. Um, in the end, it became more of a comparison study than a study to determine prevalence. This uh, study was funded by the Healthy Foods. Healthy Foods, Healthy Lives um, Institute, University of Minnesota. 